Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think there are a few more people coming in, but we have to get started because not everyone can uh, stay for two hours. So um, thank you very much for, uh, to everyone for making it to this in-person event. It's great to see people face-to-face -face again. And uh, today we will launch a, a report that you all have in front of us, but I'm very honored um, that we have such a distinguished panel, but also that we are going to be welcomed by Chief Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, who is president of the Conference of European Rabbis, but also president of the board of IFSA, a new institute that he will talk about right now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Neumann, the head of IFSE. It is a great pleasure to be here to see you in person. We had quite a few events of IFSE online and on Zoom, and, and I'm happy that we're slowly coming out of our uh, Zoom bunkers back to real life, and we can see each other's smiles and, um, and appreciate each other's closeness. So um, I would like especially thank Guardian Serena for organizing this event together with the leadership of IFSE. I would like also to welcome here my colleague, the Chief Rabbi of Brussels, uh, Albert Gigi, and our representative to the European Union, as well as the uh, envoy of the European Union, of the European Commission the, in the struggle against anti-Semitism, Katharina von Schnurbein, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Ugler of uh, the Council of Europe, who is also responsible for fighting anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So, and I also would like to also a newfound friend we met in, in London last week of uh, uh, Dr. Fred Sofer, which just came especially from London to join us today in this, uh, in this meeting. I um, would like to start just with a little bit of a historical perspective. We're going through a pandemic, and this pandemic uh, brought us uh, much sorrow, death, disorder, discontent, political instability, but also hate and discrimination, especially online. If we're going back to history a little bit, just a little bit under 700 years, 1349, January. I was born in Switzerland, in the free city of Basel, on the Rhine, there was a little Jewish community. And uh, as the discontent in Europe grew because of the bubonic plague and the Black Death, the mob started to look for the responsible. Who is responsible for this pandemic? And the mob always looked at the ones who are different than us, the ones who look different than us, and they came to the conclusion it must be the Jews. And as the message of hatred grew, the Bishop of Basel called his colleagues from Freiburg and Strasbourg to join them in a council to see how to stop the, the mob. Mm. And they had deliberations, the but before they were able to do anything, the mob came, took all the Jews of Basel, and locked them up in a wooden hut and burned them to death. Historians do not agree on how many people we're talking about. It might be 200 people, 500 people. It is immaterial. What is important that we know that times of pandemic bring political instability, discontent, and like in time immemorial, doesn't matter if it's 700 years ago or 2021, there are those who try through populistic means to find the culprit, the guilty one. Who Scape brought this? Scapegoats. Scapegoats. And traditionally, we're, Jews were the scapegoats many times in history. And we, we, what we see today, and what IFSIS was busy doing the last few months, was to analyze who are the modern scapegoats today? And we have the new medium today. It's the social media. The social media, which is not controlled at all, or almost not controlled. And through the social media, hate, hate speech 
is coming to the masses and this hate speech also can bring death and destruction. And we know the famous quote from Professor Elie Wiesel that the crematoria in Auschwitz was not built by bricks, it was built by words. It's the word, and religious people know this more than anybody else, the word, the world was created by the word. The word is the most powerful tool of the human being. And if we do not control it, if, then we can destroy the world we live in. So I would like to thank IFSA for creating this report and for presenting this report, and I hope that we can make sure that what happened 700 years ago is not going to repeat itself again today. Thank you very much. Wow, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief Rabbi. And without further ado, I would like to present the report. Um, the report is in front of you. The title is Pandemic Hate, COVID-Related Antisemitism and Islamophobia and the Role of Social Media. And the author of that report is here with us today, Hannah Rose, and she's kindly agreed to talk about it for about 10 minutes and introduce the main contents. Over to you, Hannah. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm really pleased to present um, my new report for IFSA, uh, which discusses a new wave of anti-Semitic and Islamophobic narratives which have appeared on social media since the start of the pandemic. And this report is a deep dive into how these malicious actors have usurped the global health crisis to further their existing agendas. So we conducted interview-based research, uh, which helped us to understand not just the trends um, and the policy areas, but the impacts and behavior changes among targeted Jewish and Muslim communities throughout Europe. And so with anti-Semitism, we found three main trends. Firstly, accusing Jews of controlling the pandemic, of grabbing power. Secondly, of financially profiteering of the pandemic. And thirdly, um, what the German Monitoring Center, RIAS, refers to as post-Holocaust anti-Semitism. Um, so that's Holocaust revision, revision, revisionism, pardon me, and comparisons. And when it comes to Islamophobia, um, I identified the three main themes. Firstly, accusing Muslims of being unclean um, or deliberately infecting uh, their communities. Uh, this, uh, this conspiracy theory of Corona Jihad, which first emerged in India, um, which accuses Muslim communities of using COVID as a bioweapon. And thirdly, this idea of double standards, uh, which is used to uh, blame law enforcement or governments of um, treating Muslim communities um, with uh, more leniency than other communities because they are allegedly scared um, of being accused of racism. But what I wanted to do briefly was to pull out five key learnings that um, I brought together when I was writing um, and reviewing this report. So firstly, one key theme throughout is um, that the current content removal and moderation policies from social media companies are not nearly effective enough. And although it is true that social media companies have taken steps, um, to address this issue since the start of the pandemic. The data in this report and the examples that you'll see um, and the, the sheer ease of data collection demonstrates how far some companies have fallen short in addressing these issues sufficiently. On Instagram, for example, the hashtag Jew World Order um, had 13,900 related posts in August of this year. Um, and the hashtag New World Order in English, Spanish, French, and German, the equivalents, had 45,000 um, related posts. And I actually checked last week to see how those numbers have progressed. Um, and New World Order hashtags in English totaled 972,000, and in Spanish, 69,000. So that's a significant increase. Um, and this is, at this point, 18 months into the pandemic, um, where we know, and these facts are established, um, that conspiracy theories such as the New World Order have caused real-world harms um, and can be linked to um, protests around Europe um, and their, the um, central role that hashtags such as the New World Order have played in, for example, the January 6th insurrection in the United States um, is well documented as well. 
So at this point, we really should um, be expecting social media companies to take ro robust action against hashtags and conspiracy theories which are known to be anti-Semitic or Islamophobic. And this is across mainstream and alternative social media platforms. A second issue when it comes to content moderation is flagging. So on page 29 of the report, you'll see a screenshot um, of a post on Instagram where the COVID-related nature of the post was flagged, but the anti-Semitic nature of it was not. And this was very common in my research. Um, and social media companies have taken very... Um, very good steps to address the spread of misinformation, um, vaccine misinformation and um, uh, conspiracy theories about um, specifically relating to COVID on their platforms. Um, so we know that they recognize that this is an issue and we know that they understand the influence and the real world harms that can come from this. Um, and we know they have the technology in order to be able to do it. Uh, now they have to apply that technology to anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on their platforms. As one of my interview participants, Dave Rich from the Community Security Trust said, if they understand the real world harms of vaccine misinformation um, and understand that that can cause um, violence offline, um, then they must recognize the same for anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Secondly, what became apparent is the extent to which the far right is embedded in these movements and the inevitability of conspiracy theories within vaccine and COVID misinformation. Um, although the COVID conspiracy movement is primarily not motivated by anti-Semitism, there is an undercurrent where anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is at best tolerated and at worst actively promoted. And although not every member of this movement may be violent or racist, many of them are happy to march alongside violent racists. So we have the emergence of this diverse, multifaceted mass movement where some people don't know what anti-Semitism or Islamophobia looks like, but they don't care. And so we see the normalization of racism in Europe. A third issue I wanted to pull out was the increased mainstream exposure to harmful views and the new pathways to anti-Semitic and Islamophobic worldviews that are evidenced throughout the report. So although many people may not be driven primarily by this racism, if they are in the movement, they are almost certain to come across it. And COVID-related anti-Semitism and Islamophobia has therefore introduced racist worldviews to a new audience. And because of this reach into the mainstream of conspiracy theories, there's been greater purchase of the accompanying anti-Semitism and Islamophobia than previously. And this is evidence in the recent European Commission report, um, which looked at the quantity of French and German language anti-Semitic content on social media and saw a quantifiable increase throughout the pandemic. Fourthly, the mobilization potential of this movement is important to recognize. We've already seen significant mobilization from the COVID conspiracy movement. And for example, during lockdowns, the movement was able to mobilize large numbers to break the law and gather en masse when it was illegal in many countries. We've seen the march outside synagogues, graffiti racist slogans, and we've seen hate speech on streets across Europe. And we've seen violence too. In the UK, a violent mob tried to storm the BBC buildings. In Germany, some members of the movement tried to firebomb the German Infectious Diseases Institute. And in Italy, just last week, there was an attempt to storm the Prime Minister's office and a local accident and emergency ward. 38 police were injured, and of those arrested, the far-right leaders of some groups were present. And then we have the Netherlands, where a bomb was found at a COVID test center, which thankfully was not detonated. So the question from this report is, what happens next? What happens to the tens of thousands of people who've been radicalized online for the first time? Well, they'll likely maintain their anti-government, anti-establishment, conspiratorial core, but how they apply this to other issues is yet to be seen. And how will it manifest? Will we see mass civil disobedience and public disorder? Well, arguably, we've already seen worse than that. We may see reduced trust in liberal democracy, the undermining of state apparatus. We may see violent protests, and there may well be an impact on the terrorism threat landscape. What we know is that these people are not going away. And due to the 
um, more competitive workforce, the economic uncertainty from the pandemic. Many people have come out poorer. There's perhaps reduced government trust. The socioeconomic uh, radicalizing drivers are, so, are only increasing. So the pandemic has brought these conspiracy theories to the forefront and revealed their ugly core to wider society. Finally, I wanted to touch on the impact of this on the communities, the Jewish and Muslim communities. We see from this report that social media and the hatred on it has the ability to impact real world behaviors of faith communities. And in conversation with my colleague here, one of the findings from the Council of Europe survey, which he commissioned of Muslim communities, one finding in particular stood out to me, which was that many um, participants found that online Islamophobia was more harmful and concerning to their communities than offline. And that's due to the reach which it has and the availability and the readiness of it. So aside from COVID, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is demonstrably having a real world impact. Uh, Binny Gutman from the European Union of Jewish Students spoke at length about Instagram, the trend of infographics, and how many young people were inadvertently dipping into conspiracy theories for the first time and either not realizing it or not caring that they're spreading it. Claudia Mendoza from the Jewish Leadership Council in the United Kingdom anecdotally spoke of fear throughout the community, the Jewish community in the UK, during the May 2021 spike in anti-Semitism where social media facilitated this fear about every incident of anti-Semitism that happened. And so behavior changed. People were more concerned to go out on the streets because of what they'd seen online. Just to finish, I'd like to discuss um, two of the broad policy recommendations which arose in this report. Firstly, to do with the legislation in this area. Um, and all of the research participants agreed that regulation is a must. And this regulation really has to close every loophole. Um, among these issues are um, ensuring that content that comes from outside the EU but is available in the EU is brought under this legislation. There must be penalties for non-compliance and it must recognize the diversity of platforms that we're dealing with. It's not just Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter. Um, who are well-funded and have the resources to regulate. It's the platforms who are smaller, may struggle to fund these issues, or may be extremist in nature and ideologically opposed to regulation and content removal. Katharina von Schnurbein, the um, European Commission coordinator on anti-Semitism, uh, discussed transparency in money and data flows and reporting um, and capacity building among these, um, among these social media companies. And among this is the need for culturally competent content moderators who understand the issues and are able to identify when anti-Semitism and Islamophobia rises. So it's a huge task, but the urgency for it is evidence throughout this report. A final comment about interfaith and how we can use positive relations between Jewish and Muslim communities to address these issues. One daily encounters um, and interfaith encounters between Jewish and Muslim communities are important, but there is a need for large scale, focused, productive interfaith to address the joint threats that Jewish and Muslim communities face and built this joint grassroots strategy. And as the far right and conspiracy theories only grow in Europe, Jewish and Muslim communities must present a robust and united response. So in conclusion, I'd urge you to read the report in detail to understand the depth and severity of COVID conspiracy theories on social media. This report shows that how Jewish and Muslim communities can be at the forefront of this aggression, which is facing all of us, but it is a joint whole of society response that is needed to tackle the threat that we all face as Europeans. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, for a very concise overview of the contents of the report. It was so concise that you almost don't have to read it anymore, but <laughs> you should, really, because there's a lot in this report that Hannah hasn't mentioned. I'd now like to invite two respondents um, to the report, um, two very prominent voices in European institutions, and then, of course, we will open up to the audience for questions and for discussion. Um, the first speaker is Daniel Hultgen. He is the Council of Europe's 
special representative on anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim hatred and hate crimes. And whilst everyone in Brussels, at least in the parliament, has been traveling to Strasbourg, Daniel has come to Brussels to speak to us. So thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Hannah, for your excellent presentation. I think this report is once uh, again an indicator, the latest indicator of the, the nature and extent of hatred online, which is spreading, which was there before, but has now been magnified through the pandemic. Now, we're dealing with conspiracy theories, as you mentioned, uh, which is bad enough. But the reason that I'm involved and the Council of Europe is looking at this, we're also uh, looking at potential uh, human rights violations. There are two basic rights in the European Convention on Human Rights which are affected. It's Article 9, freedom of thought uh, and conscience and belief, and Article 14, protection from discrimination. And of course, these articles are violated when we see incitement to violence, death threats, um, open racism, and Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial is not covered by Article 10, freedom of expression uh, by the European uh, Court of Human Rights. It has uh, made judgments uh, to that effect. So we're seeing potential human rights violations which are dangerous because as Hannah said, what is spread online can then actually transfer to violence, actual violence and killings um, in the real world on the street. We saw this uh, in Halle, uh, where the attacker was seeking to attack a, a synagogue, uh, and then when he couldn't get in, he went to, for the next, uh, next best victims he could find. And we saw this in Hanau also, where somebody uh, had uh, anti-migrant, anti-Muslim ideas, wanted to post this, his deed on the internet, um, and, and, and then killed nine people, mainly of, of migrant origin. So we're involved and we're concerned because what we see is very dangerous and uh, it's got to stop. I think this is very clear. It's got to stop. And uh, Katerina and I and many others were in Malmo uh, uh, last week for the International Forum Against um, Antisemitism. And there was a unanimous call on Facebook and the other operators to do more in terms of um, deleting uh, uh, and, and screening uh, messages uh, of, of hate to take down more. We heard from the top of Facebook uh, that yes, it's very regrettable that these things happen and it's uh, very important to do more in future. Uh, but sometimes I think this response is a little half-hearted. Can I give you an example that while Facebook is saying this, on the other hand, they have appealed against the German Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, which is a law uh, that um, now criminalizes um, hate speech online and requests the uh, companies who take down uh, such hate to notify uh, the Federal Crime Agency also of the IP addresses which, which post this and uh, Facebook and Google have appealed against that, which is a clear sign that they're not 100% um, on, on board. It partially, of course, also touches their, their business model. Um, you mentioned content moderation. I would like to recall a recent judgment in Paris brought forward by the Jewish Union of Students, which is very, very interesting. Um, they uh, were claiming that during the pandemic, they had confronted Twitter in particular, uh, with uh, clearly illegal hate speech, um, and Twitter only took 20% uh, of it down. And the Paris court has now judged that Twitter has an obligation to re reveal its resources, its technical or human resources involved uh, in content moderation. So we don't know much about what actually happens. Is it all artificial intelligence? Is it uh, actual people? Are those people linguistically capable of identifying the hate speech? That, according to this judgment, uh, has to be revealed by Twitter. I don't know if they, in the meantime, have appealed against the judgment, but it was brought to Twitter in uh, Ireland, which means that effectively it has um, a, a European-wide uh, implication. So I think, Content moderation is, is another aspect. And let me just fin finish off with, with uh, anti-Muslim hatred. 
Anti-Muslim hatred online um, is important for the same reasons we've just discussed uh, regarding anti-Semitism. But it, there's another reason, which is also very important. If governments choose to ignore the kind of hatred which is spread online against Muslims, if politicians don't care about that, what is the impact going to be on, on the Muslim community? Especially the impact on young Muslims who are susceptible to what they see against them on the internet, but other things they see as well um, on the internet, which might entice them, incite them to acts of aggression themselves. So I think if politicians were to ignore this, they would not be contributing to integration of Muslims, and they would also, I think, risk efforts of uh, fighting extremism. extremism. And, and with that point, I think um, I can then finish, uh, and, and, and that leads very well to my colleague from the European Union. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel Hultgen. Um, now, our next speaker and final speaker for today um, is uh, Ilka Salmi. Uh, he is the EU's counterterrorism coordinator, recently appointed, and if I'm not completely wrong, this is your first proper public event, right? So there you go. Uh, first proper public event. We're very honored. Thank you very much. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Actually, indeed, it's my first uh, public appearance in this role. And thank you very much for the invitation. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And also, congratulations and thank you for a an, for an very important report, actually, which very well highlights the seriousness and, and growing problem in our society as, as, as we see it. And also the, the sensible proposals that it, you know, uh, to how to tackle these issues. Indeed, in my role as the EU's counterterrorism coordinator, of course, my main focus is how to counter terrorist threats. Then again, um, the fight against expressions of hatred against the Jews and Muslims is actually a very important goal of its, of its own and as an integral part of the values of the European Union that goes without, without saying. At the same time, as was already mentioned by the, by the colleagues, this subject is directly relevant to the counterterrorism in, in a way that the hate speech could inspire terrorists to commit acts of, of violence. So indeed, a very, very um, issue for my office as well to look into. Again, it was already mentioned uh, that there has been, over the recent years, Islamist extremist terrorists attacked churches, Hindu temples, mosques, and Jewish targets, uh, such as the Jewish Museum here in Brussels, just to name uh, one. Then again, just last week, Daesh uh, attacked a Shia mosque in the north of Afghanistan, killing of hundreds of people. Right-wing terrorists in New Zealand, United States, Canada, and here in Europe attacked synagogues and mosques, and they do present a growing threat to our societies. The anti-Semitic hatred originates from both right-wing violent extremism and Islamist extremism. There is also a worrying trend of anti-Semitism among left-wing extremists who collectively blame Jews for perceived injustices. Uh, committed by the State of Israel. And then the main issue I've already mentioned by my colleagues, the internet does play a crucial role in spreading terrorist ideologies and connecting violent extremists in disparate parts of the world with each other. So indeed, this is one of the main issues that we are looking also from the counter-terrorism point of view. A just very quick assessment on the, on the uh, terrorist threat due to the pandemic. It was my predecessor, Schilde Kerkhoff, who already in, in May 2020 pointed out that he was actually quite concerned about the increase in terrorist threats as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Basically, his justification for this and, and the, the issues that he based his, his assessment was exactly the dramatic increase in expressions of hate online and its conversions with disinformation and conspiracy theories. If you look into the statistics, indeed the latest ones published by the Commission in April 21, 2021, actually showed that there has been a seven-fold increase in anti-Semitic content on Twitter, Facebook, and Telegram in French language, and a 13-fold increase in German language. So a huge, uh, huge increase, all in all. 
I would say fortunately, at least as we speak, the COVID pandemic has not led into a terrorist attack, uh, uh, or the increase in number of terrorist attacks, at least yet. At the same time, there are no indications that the wave of hate speech triggered by the pandemic has now diminished in any way, and as shown in the, in the report, words do have a consequence. Expressions of hate can inspire violent action, as I mentioned, and according to the research by the EU's fundamental rights agency, minority groups in Europe do not feel safe. That's exactly the reason why also my office remains very vigilant on these issues. Well then, what is EU trying to do to tackle this, these problems? Uh, what would be the, the uh, reply? Firstly, allow me to just specify that in the EU institutions we use the term anti-Muslim hatred uh, instead of Islamophobia, which has sometimes at least been instrumentalized to stifle, uh, stifle criticism of extremist uh, interpretations of, of Islam. Many of the policy areas linked to the combating anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred are the responsibility of the EU's member states. The EU provides policy guidance, coordinates actions by the member states, monitors implementation, funds projects, and facilitates the exchange of good practices. The EU legal framework exists in order to tack uh, tackling hate speech online, especially the EU framework decision on combating racism and xenophobia obliges member states to criminalize hate crimes and hate speech. Again, the audiovisual media services directive requires member states to ensure that video sharing platform providers take measures to protect general public from content containing incitement to violence or hatred, including anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim content. And then one of those uh, regulations, which is actually on, on one of the top priorities for my office, uh, also the implementation and the follow-up, is the terrorist content online regulation, which requires the online platforms to remove terrorist content referred by member states within one hour. It is really important that the member states now do enforce this, and as I mentioned, we will certainly will, will be looking into the implementation of, of the regulation very, very thoroughly. Online platforms, engagement against the hate speech and the disinformation is fundamental. Most major IT companies have committed to the EU code on countering illegal hate speech online and the EU code on disinformation. Having said that, I do share the concerns already expressed by, by the colleagues here in the panel, and absolutely um, we will continue a very lively dialogue with these companies in the very near future. Actually, even during the course of this week, we will have a discussion with a few of them just to understand what sort of measures they have taken or will be taken in this respect so that we would have an, an, uh, a clearer understanding. Also, the, the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism um, uh, is a platform which has been set up by the tech companies, the tech industry to bring together experts from the dig dig digital sector governments as well as, as academia. And the forum is currently producing a knowledge package to guide the social media platforms voluntary efforts to, uh, in moderating content stemming from the vi violent right-wing extremism. And in addition to that work uh, undertaken to better understand the limit of exploitation of algorithm recommender systems promoting anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim content platform. So what would be then the way forward? I would say that the member states have committed, as I pointed out, the review, uh, renewing their strategies on preventing racism, xenophobia, radicalization, and violent extremism by the end of 2022. Also, as stressed in the IFFSC report, those strategies should include interfaith work and civic education in order to improve the resilience of our societies against hate speech and disinformation. Similarly, as indicated in the new EU strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, the Commission will support Member States' efforts to develop national strategies on combating anti-Semitism again by the end of 2022, or include at least the measures against anti-Semitism in their national action plans against racism. The implementation of the new strategy will benefit the prevention of the fight against both anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim hatred. 
on a more, let's say, operational field, the European inter inter Internet Referral Unit at Europol flags terrorist content to digital companies so that they can block such content. The IRU should receive sufficient resources to do its job. Again, an issue that I'm more than happy to advocate for. Again, one final thing also on my priorities and one consideration uh, that I would add to this excellent report relates to the algorithm amplification of divisive and polarizing content. As long as the IT companies have business model based upon optimizing users' time online, relying on the promotion of, uh, of, of uh, radical content, uh, I would say that we really need to look into this mechanism, which, as was pointed out by the colleagues, would give an, an actually a platform to spread these messages far and wide and very, very rapidly. Again, one final thing. In last December, uh, the European Council stated the importance of ensuring that religious education and training are in line with fundament, uh, European fundamental rights and values, quote and unquote. This would also help to address antisemitism. Several member states have supported initiative, initiatives in this context, and it will be an important link across the EU. And finally, one thing that I'm about to, to engage in the very near future is a dialogue with the partners in the Gulf region in order to address the spread of Islamist extremist materials in the EU. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, seems like you have a lot to do in, uh, in, in, in your new job. But now we have about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes to um, discuss the report that and everything that has been said by our panelists. So if anyone wants to ask a question or uh, make a comment, please just raise your hand, introduce yourselves, um, and then we'll take it from there. So who wants to start? The first one is always the most difficult one, so you go ahead. Could you please uh, tell us who you are? feels like a concert. Um, <laughs> congratulations on your report. Um, I can see how well researched it was and um, how thorough it is and how, um, how applicable it is in, from a policy perspective. Um, I, was, I had two questions um, for you, Hannah, um, and for the, um, a, and a question about the counter-terror implications of your report. Um, first of all, what was very um, enlightening is that uh, the y we you could prove that the technology is available to for the social media platforms to sift through and find anti-Muslim hate and, and anti-Semitic content, which is um, a very, very effective point to start, I would think, especially from the WJC perspective. Our in our di dialogue with social media platforms, it's a very good place to start. And I was wondering whether um, in your report you found um, non-EU uh, manipulation of the technology um, spreading anti-Semitic hate. So, for example, states that have been known to sponsor terrorism to use um, bots and technology to spread anti-Semitic hate during the time of the pandemic. And... Um, so, Mr. Salmi, um, I, I wanted to ask on, on your, your final point that you made just before you finished, um, activity in the Gulf. Um, I would, I would um, congratulate you on, on, on seeing that point where, um, in my experience, I've found that there is a lot of openness to discussing that. And I think that could be a very effective, if I may suggest, a very effective tool in interfaith dialogue. Um, in, in addressing that point together with the Gulf states. I think it could um, strengthen uh, our position as, as liberal democracies and um, increase understanding. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for your question. Um, what was quite surprising to me is when I was gathering the data, the majority of anti-Semitic and Islamophobic content that I found came from um, accounts which didn't appear to be bots, um, people who were uh, felt confident um, 
expressing these views to their Facebook friends, uh, to their Twitter followers. Um, so, of course, it's quite difficult to, especially on some forums such as 4chan, Telegram, which I looked at as well, it's quite difficult to verify exactly where um, users are located. Um, I, looking into government on non-government wasn't something um, I specifically investigated. It's a very interesting um, area for further research. Um, but as you say, any because of the availability of content online, um, it's very easy for content which may not be able to come under EU regulation to still arrive at the doorstep of EU users. Um, so that's definitely an issue for um, the regulation policies. Um, but looking at state versus non-state is definitely a, an area of further interest. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I have to give credit for that dialogue. I actually, started already some uh, you know a while back with my my predecessor. So very happy to take that on board, and I certainly take note of your your comment and recommendation in that respect. Thank you. Any further um, questions or comments, sir, in the back? I echo my uh, everybody else's comments about the report. Superb. Um, really fascinating report. Um, I wanted to ask, if I may, specifically about the uh, legislative opportunities. Um, I know it's probably not deeply fashionable in this room today, but the UK um, has a rather good um, um, draft bill on this particular issue that seems to focus on the statutory duty of care of the companies that they have to their users. Um, which is a little, it, it, it's, it's a way of making sure that the companies are uh, stopped before they promote anti-Semitic hatred rather than punished afterwards. And I was interested to see within the European framework if there is a way in which that could be um, um, advanced. Um, and the, the example I wanted to give is a specific example. If you were to type into a Google uh, or a Facebook search, um, I hate Jews, it's only a few seconds need to go past before Facebook and Instagram bombard you with all the most wonderful places you can go to find how you can hate Jews even more. So uh, th they are not only carrying it, but promoting it, and therefore they surely have a duty of care to their users. Uh, no, actually, because you're talking about EU legislation compared to UK legislation, um, and that is really not in my remit. Um, so I would then uh, ask the EU or Katerina to come in. All I would say is that the Digital Service Act goes in that direction. It actually puts a larger responsibility on the major platforms um, to uh, actually control what they're putting out. Um, and that responsibility they will be very aware of because it's connected to pretty hefty fines if they don't do that. But of course that has to be enacted first. Um, and I do see similarities with the, with the UK. Uh, with the UK. Um, yeah, that's what I would say on that, on that point, please. Actually, very, very little to add to that. Uh, the Digital Services Act is indeed an, a step towards that direction. I don't really know the UK legislation of the draft bill, so I can't compare those two, but that's exactly actually, actually the point trying to, to look into these issues from that respect. And certainly, again, one of those uh, pieces of legislation that, that my office is following, again, closely, whether we would have these elements taken on board um, in a sufficient manner. Hello, I'm, I'm Peter Borson with uh, RUSI Europe, a think tank on security and defense in, in Brussels. Thank you, Hannah, for the report. Thank you for the event. Uh, I'm curious from also from the historical perspective, including within the EU, but also from the chief rabbi, what, what really works? It feels like the, the initiatives you talk about here are very much downstream. I mean, this is sort of at the end of the river. We are spewing out lots of information, much of it bad, some of it good and we're trying to stop a little tiny bit of it, and we're trying to figure out are the, are the tools wrong, but we're not really talking about more upstream, what's happening in people's minds, what are the incentives to do that, why they keep being amplified, and why do they keep growing. Is there a role for education? I'm sure there is, but 
it would be curious just to hear from you what, what of your projects, what of your legislation has already worked? Let's maybe start with the Chief Rabbi, since you were implicated, and then uh, Hannah. Um, I think um, that you ch touched most probably the most important point that uh, we d don't have just to react in order to clean away all the information we don't want to appear on the internet and all the hate speech, we have to tackle the root of the problem. And of course the root of the problem is, is education. And uh, I think that this was one of the issues uh, tackled by this paper issued by Katarina and the EU Commission uh, on combating anti-Semitism is dealing with the educational uh, issue that already in schools all over Europe there should be education towards um, tolerance and against uh, hate speech and uh, having uh, students and children being taught the values of of uh, compassion and tolerance and living together and respecting each, each other traditions. Just last week, I participated at a, a, a peace meeting uh, organized by, it, was, it used to be the Assisi peace meeting organized by the Vatican, now it's organized by the Sant'Egidio community. Of course, getting all the uh, religious leaders of the world together to uh, come up with a statement that we have to work together and, and to, um, uh, and to do everything to save this planet and to save humanity from pandemic as well as global warming. So there are initiatives on all different levels, religious levels, on, on secular levels, civil society. It's not enough. It is not enough. And, and whatever is being done is um, maybe a tip of the iceberg because the information which is given over today through the social media is so massive that it might, uh, it is uh, so much more massive than any single event which uh, can be organized by well-meaning individuals, religions, or states. Mm. Hannah, did you want to respond as well? Yes, thank, thanks for your question. I think there have been a few small-scale initiatives that have started working but need to be combined um, and really applied consistently. Um, so for example, um, of course, everyone will know that on Twitter and Facebook and such platforms, accounts have been flagged as um, state-sponsored, for example, um, a Chinese state-sponsored outlet or a Russian state-sponsored outlet, um, outlet, and as such, um, as ex exemplified in the report, COVID misinformation um, is flagged as well. So we know um, that this can work um, in the re reduction of spread of misinformation. Um, however, this now needs to be applied this needs to be applied to anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other harms on their platforms. When it comes to the removal of terrorist content, there have been um, some good examples of data hashing and cross-platform co um, collaboration where terrorist content has been effectively removed. But again, this now needs to be applied to all legal but harmful content, not just illegal content. And finally, the removal of actors on mainstream platforms, um, terrorist actors, um, for example, whose accounts have been removed from Facebook or Twitter, um, has had a positive impact on those online communities. However, this needs to be applied consistently. Anecdotally, when I was doing this research, I came across a Twitter account which was based in the US, which is why um, I didn't include it, um, but the, the picture was of Adolf Hitler. There was a quote in the byline from Adolf Hitler and a lot of anti-Semitic content. Um, and I flagged it, and when I checked a week later, it still wasn't removed. You know, if Adolf Hitler doesn't flag um, on their algorithms, I don't know what would. However, in the same week, a friend of mine who was quoting something that um, a um, member of the Nazi party had said in order to, um, for research purposes, um, and to exemplify how that was being used in speech nowadays, that was flagged and his, um, his account was taken down temporarily. Um, 
as a researcher and um, anti-fascist campaigner he was. So we see this um, irregular application of content removal and moderation policies. Um, and what it needs is this legislative coordination in order to be able to um, implement it on the scale that we need. Um, I was asked about legislation, and I couldn't say much about legislation, but what I can say um, is um, something about the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I mentioned the articles in question. Um, we have a very recent judgment by the court which has been criticized, um, but I think is very interesting. And um, it doesn't affect anti-Semitism, but anti-Muslim hatred. And the gist of it is that the European Court of Human Rights has ruled that anyone, but perhaps not anyone, but anybody with responsibility and a personal profile who posts on social media can be found guilty of inciting hatred and violence if they do not delete discriminatory comments made by others on their page. This is quite a far-reaching um, judgment, and it was made in a, in a French case where a mayor of a town who belonged to and still belongs to the Le Pen party had a Facebook account and one of his follow followers posted on that Facebook account um, blatantly anti-Semitic, an sorry, anti-Muslim anti hatred, um, which could also be seen as incitement to violence, so illegal content. And I think this shows how far um, the court is already responding to the danger of, of hate speech. So you can be made responsible uh, uh, if you're complicit uh, in, in this sort of thing. And I think this is very, very important. We didn't have the, that, those kind of judgments uh, 10 years ago where the mantra was freedom of expression. But I do agree we have a delicate uh, division to make, decision to make between clearly illegal content and, and the gray zone. Um, which I think companies should be taking care of because it'd be very, very difficult to, uh, to restrict freedom of expression to an extent that um, anything that, that is inflammatory or which is um, hurtful uh, then, then is also uh, um, mandatorily uh, uh, delete, deleted from accounts. I don't think we, we can go that far. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, just before we get a couple more questions, because so many interesting things were said, I wanted to respond to something that Chief Rabbi said, which is that uh, it's, of course, true. Um, initiatives by yourselves and by colleagues of yours are going to be drops in the ocean when compared to the awesome powers of the Internet promoting bad things. So when dealing with these Internet companies, rather than just focusing on content removal, shouldn't we also maybe push them to use these awesome powers that they have to promote something good? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be equally important in our engagement with, uh, with these companies? They do have awesome powers. They do determine what we think to some extent. And shouldn't we, shouldn't we insist on them doing something positive with it rather than just preventing them from doing something bad? Just a thought. Anyway, we had a couple of questions in the back. Oh, we have uh, 15 questions. But let's take them all together, and let, then let's do a final round. We'll start with uh, you, Barbara. Yes, here. Oh, no, 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 Gary, here, yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Anna Zizola from the European Commission, from DG Home, and I work in the <coughs> sorry, Prevention of Radicalization Unit. Uh, and we are responsible for the EU Internet Forum. Um, so <coughs> thank you very much to Mr. Salmi for uh, listing our initiatives. Uh, I think Peter stole part of my intervention because I was going to mention the importance also of, of course, of you know, taking down terrorist and violent extremist content, but also to propose something positive. And we're actually working on that within the EU Internet Forum. We have a program called CSAP, which is a program that provides funds to civil society to produce, together with companies, to produce um, positive narratives and, uh, and alternative narratives. Uh, we are in a process of evaluation now to see what really works and what doesn't work. But we're also cooperating with international fora like the Christchurch Call to Action and the Gift City, the Global uh, Internet Forum. 
to to really work on understanding what is what works, what has an impact on users, what positive narratives can work in each situation. And on the borderline content, which we mentioned, so that the legal but awful <laughs> content, lawful but awful, they used to call it, uh, that is a real challenge and it's, it's bigger uh, than we probably, um, that we probably said it today, you know, it's, uh, it's something that companies keep flagging, they need more guidance on that, but I agree with Mr. Holken when he says we cannot really regulate on that, it's really hard to regulate. So the relationship with companies and the cooperation with companies on a voluntary basis is, uh, is very important, but we need to be all together and to, to, to work really hard on that, and only company can do something against it. Excellent. Awful but lawful. That's yeah. a new, <laughs> new thing that I've learned today. In the back, please, and then we go to Katharina von Schnurbein, and then you. Yes. Thank you. Kenneth Lazun, I lecture on intelligence and national security at the University of Antwerp, and um, one of the biggest challenges with this sort of discourse is being able to predict when it will lead to violence, especially violence committed by lone actors, which unfortunately we have again been confronted with in the past few weeks. And now in recent years there has been more research um, trying to get artificial intelligence through natural language processing to make predictions about certain individuals as they get on a path towards um, violent behavior and actually putting the deed to their thoughts. And I was wondering if, if this is a certain research that you have been following, um, what progress it has been making, and whether you believe that this, this might have potential, especially for intelligence and security services, to, um, being to actually be effective in, in trying to prevent, especially lone actor violence. Excellent, thank you very much. Now, Katharina von Schnurbein. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for the panel, Hannah, for uh, this excellent work. Um, I would uh, like to add a few things that have, uh, a lot has been said, uh, education and, uh, uh, and also the work, the close work that is necessary with the platforms. We will be working as part of the EU strategy on uh, anti-Semitism also with DG Home and the, um, the internet um, uh, platform in order to make sure that we will have uh, fact checkers, for example, with regards to disinformation and fake news that can recognize um, specific anti-Semitic content based on the IRA definition and then develop counter-narratives. So the things that are that cannot be taken down but are uh, still very harmful because they can lead to uh, radicalization. Uh, that's one point. I think another point is um, with regards to legislation, what we have already is that um, what is illegal offline is also illegal online and therefore should be brought to justice. However, this is not happening uh, a lot at the moment. Um, we have a few cases, examples in France, there are a few cases uh, in a few member states, but all over uh, in general, um, we have, I think, a lack of capacity, a lack of recognition, and it's very important to ensure, and this is also one of the, um, the um, issues we are raising and will increasingly raise uh, with member states to ensure that, um, that online haters are being uh, brought uh, to, to court and to justice. We will uh, organize um, in order to reach the general public, and I think there is one aspect also uh, here, we have got so used to the fact that if we want to use the internet, uh, we just have to put up with a certain amount of hate. And I think you know, th this is something some companies have said stop. Coca-Cola at some stage said we are not going to have any ads next uh, to um, hate speech unless you can guarantee this. We are no longer going to uh, give any uh, funds to you for advertising. Very successful, you know, very quickly um, there, was a, there were clean uh, pages next to Coca-Cola um, advertising. So I think there is also a, a question of changing the, 
the awareness and the narrative among uh, general public. And one thing we want to do as part of the strategy is create a hackathon among experts on the one side and then also uh, those who can deal with technology and also um, content uh, related issues and develop new ways of addressing uh, hate speech uh, online. I have a few copies of the strategy uh, there and also of the um, report that was mentioned uh, by Hannah where uh, that is about the pandemic and uh, COVID related content in French and uh, German. So feel free to take those. Excellent, thank you very much. And we have a final question for today from over here. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Katerina Cognini and I represent the European Union of Jewish Students. And so, uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much, uh, Hannah Rose, for this report. As uh, I would say, this is a first and testimony of what, especially representing young European Jews that live every day online on social media, since they are most of the time the first target of such hatred. And this is really um, bringing to the table what we are living every day in our, our, in our everyday life. Um, and also, I would like to uh, actually have a fast question, uh, more a, cu a curiosity for you that um, I wanted to ask you if in your research, if you had, um, I guess most of these accounts, most of the time where it was very sometimes difficult to identify maybe the authors, but I wanted to ask you if you identified a sort of precise profile in the people that was posting such um, ha hateful content, if there was a some in some way a more specific profile of there was like a more big variety in that sense of who was posting such things. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, and Gadi, you, Gadi is one of the organizers. Um, you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You have uh, special rights. Go ahead, Gadi. Special rights. Okay, so my name is Gadi Gornish. I want just to add maybe a small remark. I don't know if it's a question, but it's a remark. We are speaking here about education which is very important to raise for the few times in the discussion. I think we need to give some attention to the issue of training of religious leaders. Because we know, we hear, we know, there's a lot of influence, negative influence coming from, from this side. Everybody speak about this, everybody is aware of this, but there's no steps down there. So I think this is something we need to take in consideration when the big word of education and the negative influ influence were coming from some, especially some countries, religious leaders. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Gadi. So we had a number of points, one about research, um, the other one about the profiles of individuals who are posting, and Gadi raising the issue of training of religious leaders. I want to give every panelist a chance to respond to all or any of this, and then Chief Rabbi Goldschmidt will close the session. Thank you very much. Let's start with you, Daniel. Well, um, we are witnessing in some member states a, a secularization of society, which makes it difficult enough for religious leaders of whatever denomination to uh, keep track of their sheep and make sure their sheep are going the right direction. We also witness in some member states legislation or trends which go against religious practices, in particular of Jews and of Muslims. And I think this is where perhaps an interchange would be very useful. So I think for religious leaders have a double challenge here. In some cases, they're confronted with um, societies which do not take into account the importance of religion for people. And I think this is something that perhaps we should bear in mind. Religion is a source of comfort, of inspiration, uh, especially during difficult times. And we should recognize that, and I think le political leaders need to recognize that. But there is a trend towards secularization, which is not always helpful to the kind of dialogue that, you, that you're talking about. And then, there is, of course, there is the general remark that everybody will understand. You, you can't love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor, if you don't know what your neighbor is actually up to. And this is the duty of faith leaders to be teaching about the, 
the other, um, but also who listens to faith leaders and who is important. It's the young people. So I see both. What I would like to see European organizations sponsor, and I will make an attempt uh, at that, is, is what do young Muslims, young Jews, young Christians, young atheists think about freedom of protection of belief, conscience, and, um, and, and religion? How do they practice that? How do they see the other? And how do they see this debate going on, on on the internet? Because if we don't have this debate with tomorrow's generation, this will just perpetuate. So I think we have both sides, the leaders, I think you, this is a very, very important point, but also the recipients and the users of, of, of the internet today. Um, and, and I would like to see that kind of uh, uh, Pinchas, this kind of dialogue that you had on a high level with young, uh, young leaders or young people of, of, of tomorrow, and perhaps we can join forces on that. Um, thanks for all the interesting comments. I agree with much of what was said, um, and I look forward to seeing the, um, the European Commission's review um, of those um, civil society efforts that they've been um, working on. I think that'll be very interesting. Um, to respond to your point, Katerina, about um, the profile of people, um, well, of course, it's quite difficult to identify many people on social media, particularly on Telegram and 4chan. The vast majority of users will be anonymous. So um, I couldn't come to any quantitative conclusions at all. Um, the best example would be if you were to look at the demonstrations that are happening throughout Europe, you'll see both far-right actors and everyday mainstream people quite representative of wider society. Um, I think if you were to um, be able to understand the drivers of what leads people to conspiracy theories and um, what types of people are susceptible to them, um, we would be in a very different place in terms of um, assessing um, the outcomes and impacts of conspiracy theories. Um, that would be very interesting research to undertake um, in the future. Thank you. On the very question about the new, new tech or the uh, artificial intelligence in order to, to predict the behavior or, or uh, you know, potential perpetrators, two things that I just want to point out. One of the, let's say, four top priorities that I have for, for my office is exactly to look into what I call the new tech and security. So basically to see what, what's available. I mean, on one hand, what could be used against us in a way, and then again, what could be used in order to, to um, to protect us, to put it bluntly, and, and, and this is something which is going on. We are about to, to do a, a report on this issue also to have a, a language. I don't know the specific study that you were referring to, but, but indeed something which is hugely, hugely interesting. I will also be doing a tour, kind of a European tour to the member states to, to discuss with their law enforcement and security agencies in, just in order to understand what sort of a needs they might have and whether it's something that we could add value on, 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 the, on the European level. So I would be absolutely convinced that these issues will, will come up during, during that course of the work. Sounds very interesting and indeed uh, to, to see how, how to, to, to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to the panelists um, and to everyone in the audience for a very interesting discussion. We will be here for another half hour and uh, have a drink with you. There will be a reception, right? It's already outside. It's waiting for you. And, uh, but the final word will go to Chief Rabbi Goff. Over to you. By, by the way, it's the only place where I get the final word. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I think this was a very fruitful discussion, and uh, uh, we have learned uh, many new things. First of all, thank you, Hannah, for a wonderful report. I'm very um, happy that uh, we're coming out of this meeting with some call to action, and some concrete proposals, because we all know the problem. We all are aware of the problem. The question is, how do we deal with the problem? We actually, we are discussing here a changing world, it is a changing world not be only because of the pandemic, it is a changing world because the changing media. Last time there was a change in media with the printing press of Gutenberg, also the world almost came apart with the 100 year war. So we are today also in this changing world with the changing media and with the pandemic and we are still alive, that's the good news. So, but we have to go as was said, not only downstream, but also upstream, 
look to the root of the problem. And here we also are coming back to the famous speech of Sacha Baron Cohen as well as President Macron in 2019. Who is really responsible for what is happening on the platforms of social media? Is it the social media companies or are these the states or both together? That's the question we are tackling today. And thank you everyone for coming and come back safe home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.